Welcome everyone. My name is Cesar Rodriguez Garavito. I'm the, the director of the Climate Litigation Accelerator at the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice uh, at NYU School of Law. This is our last webinar of 2021. So um, special thanks to all of you who have endured until the very end of a very uh, challenging and hectic, but also exciting year in terms of climate litigation and climate advocacy and climate law in general. Of course, this is coming in the wake of, of, of the COP in Glasgow. And uh, we have a full year ahead of us in 2022, um, because of, as we all know, of course, uh, this will be a crucial moment for a big push on accountability, ambition, speed in climate mitigation, climate adaptation, and, and, and loss and damage work. Uh, so we wanted to wrap up the year with a special webinar on a key case. As uh, many of you know, CLX uh, hosts a monthly webinar, um, and we um, share the recordings from the webinar in the CHRGJ's uh, webpage. By the way, you can see our past webinars, the recordings there already, including the November webinar on uh, big ag and big food and in, and in the climate cost of those industries. Uh, but this case uh, and this webinar goes back to fossil fuel uh, production. As uh, we all saw, um, a COP, the largest delegation was the uh, lobbyist, uh, were the lobbyists from the fossil fuel companies. Uh, and uh, at the very last minute, the language about um, uh, phasing out uh, fossil fuels and coal uh, got watered down, but there was some progress. Uh, and uh, the theory of change behind the CLX's work is that progress will come uh, out not only of those uh, intergovernmental processes, but crucially from pressure from the bottom up. Inclusion, including, of course, through litigation, but also through direct action, through social movement, uh, pressure, and other forms of citizen uh, engagement. So this is a very fitting way to close the year and before we all uh, adjourn until uh, February in terms at least of the webinars. And uh, this is also um, a, a special opportunity, a special occasion for us because uh, the two panelists, uh, um, that we have uh, to comment on the case today are also very close uh, collaborators of the work that we have been doing uh, with the CLX uh, community of practice that comes together every month. So the case for today is uh, the challenge of the ECOP uh, pipeline. So I'll say a few words about the case uh, and then turn it over to uh, Mark from Natural Justice. I'll introduce him properly in a moment and then to Rikidi uh, who have been active in this case as, of course, the litigant nat natural justice and as an independent scientific um, expert in the case of Rick, uh, working on different angles of, the, uh, of this lawsuit. So this year's report by the International Energy Agency made clear that in order to maintain our chance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, the development of new oil and gas resources must come to an immediate end. Flying in the face of this fact, Total and the China National Offshore Oil Corporation have planned to build the world's largest heated crude oil pipeline, slated to run between Uganda and Tanzania. In addition to the substantial climate impacts the new pipeline would generate, it would cut through communities and sensitive ecosystems, spawning additional environmental and human rights harms. To address these climate, environmental, and human rights harms, a coalition of African organizations have filed suit in the East African Court of Justice, challenging the authorizations that the Ugandan and Tanzania governments have given for the construction of the pipeline, as well as the legality of the pipeline itself. The plaintiffs rely on a mix of legal arguments. Argument arguments that the uh, government's actions and the pipeline itself are inconsistent with applicable environmental, administrative, constitutional, and human rights law. Ultimately, the plaintiffs are seeking both declaratory and injunctive relief, including a declaration that the governments violated the law by signing the agreements facilitating the construction of the pipeline, an injunction preventing the construction of the pipeline through protected ecological areas and an order requiring the government, if the pipeline is allowed to proceed, 
to comply with national and international law in the pipeline construction and undertake meaningful climate and environmental human rights impact. Um, full disclosure, CLX has been accompanying this uh, this uh, lawsuit uh, has been supporting it in, in various ways. Uh, of course, we have not had any leading role in it, but we've um, helped develop the climate impact uh, the argument and engaged uh, Rick Heedy, a CLS associate, uh, to conduct an independent expert assessment of the greenhouse gases emissions that the Kia COP uh, pipeline would produce. So with that, um, I'll introduce Mark first and turn it over to him to comment on the legal strategy and then I'll introduce Rick and turn it over to him to comment on the scientific assessment of the emissions. So Mark Odaga is a senior program manager at Natural Justice and is based in their Nairobi office. He provides strategic advice on and supports litigation across different program areas. In addition to policy and legal reform advocacy, he also assists in providing technical and legal advice to partners, affected communities, and other stakeholders. So Mark, uh, thanks again for uh, making time for this webinar. Uh, could you comment briefly on what the strategic goals of the EACOP case uh, are? Thank you, Rick. Um, just by way of brief background is to say that um, a, a number of non-governmental African organizations, I think, were pushed to rush to court to challenge this project because what we observed was uh, a sort of hurried rush to get approvals and implementation of the project before certain checks were made. So in November 2020, we rushed the East African Court of Justice, um, reflecting the fact that this is quite a huge uh, project that affects all three East African countries, but also due to concerns that um, they might not be a fair hearing um, in some of the domestic courts, given previous experiences that some of the partner organizations had had uh, challenging some of the oil exploration activities in Uganda, for example. Uh, one of the strategic objectives was to delay the implementation of the project. So as you mentioned, uh, in addition to filing a reference at the East Africa Court of Justice, there is also pending an application for an injunction halting any project implementation. And the, the primary reason for this is to delay project construction, because if the project were to proceed as currently planned, then it would result in several human rights violations, not least you know, uh, uh, violations of the rights to property, adequate living rights of communities who have been displaced and to date are yet to be compensated, notwithstanding the fact that um, for a number of years, a lot of them have been prevented from accessing their, their land, tilling their land, and that's had a direct impact on, on their livelihoods. Um, I think there was also a concern about you know, the current pipeline route, which passes through a number of legally protected uh, areas, ecologically sensitive areas, including wetlands. Um, some of these are in close proximity to uh, communities. Uh, and they represent sources of water. And so again, uh, direct impacts to, to um, uh, access to water. Um, I think some of the longer term strategic objectives were to also, you know, in the context of the climate crisis, um, to try and set forward a positive precedents that could be used across the continent. Um, also to highlight some of the risks of the project um, as looked at in, com in comparison to, you know, the renewable energy alternatives um, and, you know, countries like Uganda, Tanzania and Kenya are all, I think, very viable uh, candidates for renewable energy exploitation. And I think also in terms of pushing back in terms of what we were seeing and how the impact assessment processes were carried out to also try and push for better precedents. So, for example, to ensure that in accounting for greenhouse gas emissions, there's consideration for scope three emissions, something that I know Rick Heed will speak more about. I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Before we uh, turn to Rick, could you give us a, a quick update on the status of the pipeline and the case itself? So at the moment, um, the, the main reference has been filed. We also filed an application for an, an injunction um, sadly, at the time we filed the case, um, the, the, the full bench of judges had not been constituted, and that's 
I think caused quite a bit of delay because there were a number of cases that had been uh, been filed and there was a bit of a backlog. So as it is, the case hadn't progressed far. We've had one court attendance at which we were given directions on the hearing of the, the injunction application. Uh, the government of Uganda requested for more time to put in its response. And we've been waiting now for a couple of months to get um, a date for the hearing of the injunction application. Um, in terms of the pipeline implementation, there's been quite a lot of activity um, in Uganda in terms of compensation, at least trying to identify those who are affected along the pipeline route and to compensate them. Um, I think the project, that process has been a little bit more advanced on the Tanzanian side. Um, but so far, you know, the project hasn't broken ground. There have been several news reports of the project having uh, um, achieved, you know, uh, reached the final investment, investment decision. Um, but we've seen it being pushed further down the line. And I think that's reflective of the fact that um, more people are being concerned about all the human rights impacts and the risks that come with investing in a project like this. Thanks, Mark. That's a good way, it's a good segue into um, Rick's um, uh, intervention. I'll introduce him briefly. Uh, Rick is the co uh, of the co-founder and co-director of the Climate Accountability Institute. He's also the principal of Climate Mitigation Services, which conducts state-of-the-art emission inventories and develops mitigation strategies for local governments, agencies, corporations, consulting groups, and NGOs. His research, including that tracking uh, the, the share of emissions of major corporate greenhouse gas polluters, has been widely cited. Rick, I'll turn it over to you. I, I uh, think you have a few slides that you want to share, right? Because the, the obvious questions to you is what you found in your study of the potential emissions being produced uh, by this uh, pipeline. And then after you have a chance to present kind of the, the, the overview of the situation and the projections, uh, we'll follow up with a few more specific questions to you. Good morning, Cesar. And, um... Thanks for inviting me and uh, also hi to all the participants who are with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think I'll skip the slides, but just introduce the project. And I was asked by Natural Justice, uh, supported by CLX, to look into uh, the adequacy of the environmental and social impacts assessment issued for the East Africa crude oil pipeline project proposed by Total and CNUC. Uh, that's likely to cost three to $5 billion to construct. Uh, in brief, it's a proposed 24 inch pipeline that will take crude oil from um, Uganda to the port of uh, Tanga in Tanzania, uh, 1,442 kilometers long. And as Sara mentioned, they will be heated electrically because the crude oil is heavy in wax. And in order to prevent its deposition inside the pipeline, it has to be heated along its entire length, as well as at the storage facility at the Port of Tanga. That requires an enormous amount of energy. Uh, in brief, my assessment of the environmental and social impacts report is that it's inadequate when it comes to the climate impacts. Uh, as expected, but is um, nowhere near best practice. They only focus on direct operational emissions from operating and heating the oil and operating the pipeline, pump stations, heating stations, as well as the energy required to construct the pipeline and trench at two meters underground for 1,400 kilometers or so. So, in their assessment, construction emissions amount to about a quarter million tons over uh, several months of construction, if not several years of construction. If you look at the operational energy and emissions requirements, we're looking at somewhere around 6 million tons of carbon dioxide from all the energy used. Um, but that pales in comparison to what I consider um, best practice, full value chain emissions transparency, as various international organizations are calling for, oil and gas companies themselves are being held to account to at least be transparent about the broader climate impact of a post project. So I um, summarized uh, 
and delved into the details of those full value chain emissions downstream from Port Tonga by including maritime transport to Chinese as well as French refineries over about 6,000 nautical miles requiring Suez Mex tank tankers of about a million barrels per shipment as well as the emissions associated with refining all of that crude oil. Uh, and over the 25 year project lifetime, we're looking at about 850 million barrels of oil being transported through the pipeline and delivered by Suez Mez tankers to various refineries. So applying an average refinery emissions factor per barrel of about 41 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per barrel refined, we're, we're looking at refinery emissions of about 6 million tons of CO2 equivalent. But of course, the largest component of the full value chain would be consumption and emissions associated with product use. So if I apply a factor and exempt for non-energy uses of petroleum for road oil and petrochemicals and other non-energy uses, we're looking at a total emissions of 330 million tons for the product use component. So in fact, the environmental impact assessment only looks at and quantifies 2.6% of the full value chain emissions, which I think ought to be transparent and published by any pipeline or, or oil and gas producer who's proposing a new project or mine. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take some questions on the details. Uh, let me just say one thing. Um, I have completed a, a report as well as an affidavit to the East Africa Court of Justice, but that report will be released uh, sometime in the next few months uh, when everything is set and ready to go. And I'm happy, meanwhile, to take anyone, anyone's uh, participants' emails and send you a notice about its release uh, when we're yeah. ready. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you mentioned it. The, certainly, it will be, we'll all be disseminating uh, that um, uh, document uh, when the time comes, hopefully sooner in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, um, out of uh, natural justice, of course, and, and Rick's own organization and, and CLX, because this is, of course, for the whole community of practice and the whole the world to see, uh, in addition to the East Africa Court of Justice. Uh, and But I wanted to pick up where you left off, uh, Rick, in terms of discussing and calculating scope three emissions. We did have a webinar on the Shell case and uh, a key finding in that case and a key holding of the of the um, Hague High Court uh, was that uh, Shell's climate impact um, should include or, or does include legally what's produced uh, throughout its uh, supply chain, including scope three emissions, meaning the burning of the of the of the um, of the fossil fuels that it produces. Could you comment a bit more about the importance of including scope three emissions uh, and both for this case, which we already did to a certain extent, but more broadly in, uh, in the industry? Well, it used to be that oil and gas companies were, were very reticent to account for scope three emissions from use of their products, which is part of the path, uh, new development at uh, the Carbon Majors Project that I run with Climate Accountability Institute was instrumental in highlighting what scope three emissions really are for 100 of the largest oil, gas, coal, and cement companies in the world over their entire history. Uh, and so that not only identified the largest players historically, but also uh, presented a challenge to the oil and gas and coal companies to follow suit and do their own calculations with better access to corporate data specifically what scope three emissions really are. And so we see not only in the international organizations, task force on climate related financial disclosures, for example, and, and other organizations calling for greater transparency in scope three. Some companies are resistant. Um, I would say that the European companies, Total included to some degree, but also Shell and, and BP and Equinor are much more transparent in scope three than the US companies that are really resisting any notion that they have any responsibility, much less accountability for the product related emissions. So we see an expanding scope for companies being 
uh, more revealing about their scope three emissions and in terms of their commitments to reduce emissions to in many cases net zero including by total by 2050 is based on their scope three emissions inventories so that's a huge progress if we can rely on their commitments to actually achieve net zero by 2050. But I think as a final comment, oil companies are, in my view, obliged to aim for net zero now. If they're proposing a new capital investment infrastructure project, be it production or pipeline, that they go to net zero starting today, not aim for 2050. We need no new high intensity infrastructure development in the, in the fossil fuel sector. Thank you, Rick. Uh, so we'll, we'll definitely come back to, to uh, emission calculations. Uh, there's already a couple of questions about that. But by the way, uh, thank you for those who have posted questions on the Q&A uh, chat uh, box. Uh, for everyone else, please feel free to do so. We'll turn to your questions in about 10 minutes, and uh, we're very keen to get uh, those and of course relate them to the to the panelists going back to legal strategy uh, mark um, what was the role of international precedence international law comparative law in uh, in the development of the legal strategy one of the things that we discussed in this uh, webinars uh, series and also in clx's work more broadly is how to quickly learn from each other how to uh, bring lessons of previous cases to bear on uh, urgent uh, climate litigation, uh, like the one that, uh, that, like the type of work that you are doing out of natural justice. So was that a factor? Was there anything uh, particularly helpful in your own research um, in preparation for the workshop, for the, for the law suit? Uh, law, um, thank, thanks, Rick. I think definitely in a case like this, there's lots of learning and exchange, first of all, between the different partner organizations, um, um, some of the petitioners uh, from Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. And I think one of the, the early sources of information was actually um, a, a court decision from Kenya in which uh, communities in, in Lam, which is in the coast of Kenya, had challenged the implementation of a port uh, down at the, the coast of Kenya. And one of the things that came out of that case was the importance, for example, of accounting for external costs as part of uh, environmental impact assessments, because a huge part of the push for the pipeline, of course, has been that it's meant to spur economic development within the region. Um, uh, unfortunately, when uh, this is being weighed in environmental impact assessments, usually there are external costs which communities bear that aren't accounted for. So I think that was one key critical um, uh, sort of uh, point of learning that we, we, we benefited from and had the assistance of experts who are uh, versed in, in, in the accounting of external costs and that forms part of the evidence in this case. I think the other uh, significant point of learning has been around you know, just the importance of scope three emissions. Um, and I think Rick, you're the one who shared the, 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 the American court decision where the court stopped the construction of the conical Phillips pipeline. You know, and amongst the reasons for that was the fact that uh, as part of the impact assessment process, they had been a failure to, uh, the, there had been an exclusion of foreign emissions uh, as part of the alternatives analysis. And so these are some of the reasons that have been formed, for example, Rick's analysis and why that forms one of the, the issues that are raised in the case. Um, and I think more broadly, I think you've also highlighted some of the, the, the precedents that we're seeing, you know, um, the case against Shell, which highlight again the importance of including some of these scope three missions. So definitely, and it's been a continuous process as well as we um, keep an eye out and try and see if there are any emerging cases, if there are any new uh, angles or strategies or, or arguments that are being used in other cases to see how that can improve and enhance the, the legal arguments in this case. Yes, that was the um, Center for Biological Diversity versus, versus uh, BLM and ConocoPhillips in Alaska about its Willa project, which would be even larger than the ECOT pipeline proposed for 100,000 barrels of, uh, per day. And EACOP at its maximum rate 
of transport would be about 79,000, sorry, 216,000 barrels per day. So it's smaller over a couple of years, but over its lifetime, uh, Willow Creek is even larger. So Rick, you were, you know, characteristically efficient in, in responding to one of the questions in the chat, but I wanted to make sure to give you time uh, to elaborate on, on uh, methane, uh, because of course there was a lot of debate about methane emissions in, at COP and our agreement about that. So could you elaborate on your response of, uh, to one of the participants questions about methane emissions in this particular project? Yeah, uh, methane emissions are important and significant uh, and should be addressed first and foremost by oil and gas companies to reduce them. This particular study did not look at field production gathering pipelines, processing facilities prior to the ECOP pipeline itself. And so that's a, the largest component of an oil project's emissions is fugitive and vented methane emissions from oil production. Um, but that's outside the scope of this particular report, which just focuses on, on oil transported through the pipeline where methane emissions are, um, to my information, at least insignificant. Uh, as well as not very important in either oil storage or there's some methane emissions there. So that is something we could look at in the future. Uh, oil transport by tanker, I think methane emissions are relatively minor and in refining we do, inc do include it in terms of CO2 equivalent per barrel refined. So it's an important subject um, and it's only partially covered in this particular study. In terms of scale, uh, Rick, it, of course, for non-experts, but like most of us here, it's hard to wrap one his or one's head around the, the numbers. Uh, what are we talking about a project that would take, say, Uganda and Tanzania, potentially will be under uh, climate commitments, although that's not, of course, this is not the uh, subject of your affidavit, but you know, more informally discussing here, are we talking about projects that are fundamentally incompatible with the level of climate action that we need to see from these countries or the global community? Or uh, is, uh, is what would be kind of your uh, way to explain to the audience the, 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 the size of, of these types of, of emissions relative to um, expectations, ambition, commitments uh, that uh, we need to see? Well, this project is relatively minor in the global scale. If you average emissions over the pipeline's 25-year expected um, planning horizon, the average em emissions might be, uh, sorry, the average production will be about 15 or so million tons of CO2 per year. And Uganda's and Tanzania's total fossil fuel use is about 17 million tons per year. So it's on, on par with both countries combined in terms of their current fossil fuel production. But this project uh, is relatively minor in global terms. Uh, we produce almost 100 million barrels of oil per day. Uh, and this project uh, is a very small proportion of that. But Total is an enormously large company. It's the sixth largest oil and gas company if you follow my accounting of the size in terms of oil and gas company production since 1965 to 2018. There are about 12 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent over that, over that history. Uh, and this project will might add 800 or so, sorry, 377 million tons in total including its product use. Uh, so divided by 25 years, that's a relatively small component of what Total and Sinuk provides every year. Thanks, Rick. And along the same lines, Mark, why from a local domestic point of view, um, what was the rationale behind challenging this particular um, project? So I think one of the most immediate reasons was considering just the, the vast amount of land that will be required for this and the scale of communities that are going to be impacted. I think um, it's going to require, I think, around 5,300 hectares of land 
think about 14,000 families that need to be directly displaced with another 10,000 households or so are also going to be impacted. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the concerning things is that a lot of these households, a lot of these communities have been prevented from accessing and using the land and this has had a direct impact on livelihoods. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, and as I said, what prompted, I think, the court action was the fact that um, a, a number of agreements were being signed quite hurriedly, giving the impression that there was definitely an intention to rush this project forward, give the impression that, you know, uh, or try and give the impression that the risks were not so high um, and that there was a higher level of compliance than I think um, was reflected in reality. So that, that was the first reason, just the, the sheer scale of impact to, to different community, communities and, and livelihoods. The other is, you know, um, some of the, the gaps and some of the assessments. So for example, it's concerning that the project isn't just going to pass through a number of wetlands, but when you try and compute the amount of water that's going to be required during the construction period, for example, um, there's a serious concern about how that might impact wetlands and communities who rely on a lot of these water sources. Um, I think more generally, looking at you know, current discussions around climate change, the importance of leaving um, unexploited fossil fuels in the ground. It's also contradictory in, in that direction. And, and I know that the discussion usually is around you know, um, countries like Uganda and Tanzania historically have contributed very little to, to climate change and emissions. But at the same time, looking at the trajectory, there's also the high risk that if, they, uh, if countries like this invest in a project like uh, the eco pipeline, there's the risk of ending up with stranded assets. Um, so those are some of the, 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 the considerations here to also try and highlight some of the, the alternatives um, to, to, to fossil fuels given that context and some of these risks. Thank you, Mark. So we're moving towards the last stretch of, of the conversation here. And this is where I'm going to rely mostly on, on questions that people have shared in this uh, uh, chat uh, and also some questions that have been shared with us in preparation for this uh, session. One broader question um, for uh, both of you, starting with Rick, is the role of this type of calculation of, uh, of scientific uh, affidavits and, and, and evidence in cases like this one. You've, of course, provided evidence for many important cases, including um, uh, the Filipino uh, complaint against couple majors, and your database is widely uh, used uh, by media, by litigants, by researchers uh, who are trying to get quality data on emission produced by major fossil fuel companies. Uh, based on all that experience, uh, Rick, where do you see the potential and so the gaps, the need for additional evidence that uh, um, uh, you can identify in the final litigation space? Well, I think being transparent uh, and complete and well-documented inventory of emissions traceable and attributable to the actions of a particular company is very important in, in litigation. Um, these companies don't reveal their history over time. They might be uh, be willing to quantify scope three emissions in current years, but I have a historical database that goes back to the as early as the 1850s for some coal companies, for example. And so oil, oil and gas companies are covered for, for decades, if not a century or more. Uh, and in Total's case, uh, we have a hundred years worth of history for, for, their, for the data. And bear in mind that Total, as well as other companies around the world, have been well aware of the threat of climate change to their core business for decades. And Christophe Bonneuil and um, Mr. Choquet and Ben Franta just published an interesting paper on what Total knew going back as early as 1971 in terms of the dire consequences of continued fossil fuel production. And they, like the US companies and others, have funded climate obfuscation and, and denial for decades and in order to perpetuate their business. So I think accounting for which companies contributed how much to atmospheric change and CO2 concentration through their products with full knowledge that these products were harmful 
and are investing 90% or more of their capital investment into additional fossil fuels is in the wrong direction. Uh, a vague commitment to net zero by 2050 that may or may not be achievable is not enough. We need to accelerate investment in renewables, as, as Mark pointed out. And Mark, uh, coming out of this recent experience of um, receiving quality scientific evidence from a from a world expert like like Rick, what how do you see the relationship between litigation strategies and scientific evidence and as as uh, other practitioners think about new cases around the world? I think what was valuable here is having some of uh, Rick's expertise and, and background in trying to, uh, I think, uh, shed more of a spotlight on the impact assessments um, and to carry out the sort of um, detailed analysis of the scope three emissions, uh, because that's, you know, we're seeing that that's become increasingly relevant and important in other cases. So bringing that to bear also in this context, I think is an important. And I think it's particularly important in terms of corporate accountability. And I think for companies like Total Energy to be, you know, for, for, for it to come out in litigation, the full extent of, you know, the, the, the emissions impacts of some of these investments um, so that right from the outset, this is something that they can be held accountable to in terms of setting a precedent also, you know, that that would be something positive to see that this sort of requirement is required because um, even in Kenya, for example, um, we have a similar pipeline project. And so, you know, uh, the precedent that comes from a case like this would be really, if, if positive, would definitely also be helpful in setting standards and, and best practice for for other developments in the in the continent elsewhere in the continent, mm -hmm. and and I would add uh, even outside of the continent because the Lamu case is a it's a pioneer um, a pioneer achievement in terms of holding uh, corporations and governments accountable for coal extraction and, and coal mining, um, which interestingly fed into your own strategy. So you learn from your own strategy, and I think there's a lot of space for uh, other organizations in other continents to learn from both cases. Certainly this one is younger, it's still ongoing. The Lamu case is already a court precedent that needs to be more actively um, disseminated, emulated, um, and uh, also discussed um, in various uh, contexts. And just a final round of questions for both of you. For Mark, one question here in the, uh, from the audience. Um, wonders whether there, uh, in your own strategic thinking about the case, did you anticipate any risks uh, in, uh, associated with this litigation or have you um, come across any unanticipated risks, uh, both in terms of uh, potential um, pushback, potential uh, political uh, community uh, risks uh, emerging from having undertaken this action? Thanks, Rick. I think that's that's a very critical question. I think yes. Uh, I, I think um, right from the outset, you know, despite the fact that the case was anchored in sort of um, very strong human rights arguments, we encountered the challenge of getting communities who would be willing to appear as witnesses, who would be willing to um, give their experiences and accounts of what's happening. And, and a lot of this is down to certain reprisal, and we've seen a lot of defenders come under. Uh, threat and attack, particularly in Uganda, where a number of them have been arrested. Um, some of the partner organizations have also been, you know, falsely accused of, you know, not having been properly registered and a number of their officers were arrested and detained for a number of hours. And so that's, that's one risk that, that we had in mind, but the, the scale and extent of it, I think, is something that has shocked us and also the fact that it has been uh, done quite openly, you know, in, in reaction to communities trying to, uh, and some of the partner organizations trying to collect information. So around issues of compensation and the number of people whose uh, lands have been compulsorily acquired, but are yet to be, to be compensated. And I think that's definitely a factor to, to bear in mind in cases like this. But at the same time, I think um, what's helped is um, where affected communities and individuals have 
you know, been a little averse to coming forward as a party to the case. Um, it's helped having, I think, organizations to be fronting this litigation because, of course, then, you know, um, they're able to pool resources, sort of, even if it's in terms of getting support um, as, as frontline defenders um, and also just build a coalition and, and, and a network with other organizations regionally and across the continent. Um, and, and so that's another strategy that's been helpful. So, um, and then of course, they now also, the partner organizations that is, have also been providing sort of an umbrella and a safe, safe space for communities to share some of the experiences uh, and trying to get means and ways of seeing how this can be translated into evidence and affidavits that are filed in, in, in the case. Um, and it's been positive to see that um, Afiego, who are in Uganda, have um, had some success. So as the case has progressed, we have been able to get a few individuals to share their experiences and to, to prepare affidavits, which are now before court. If I may add, uh, yeah. Mark, this kind of harassment of citizens and NGOs uh, in not only Kenya, but Tanzania and, and Uganda is very regrettable. And I call on both Total and Sinok to make it clear to the, both governments that this kind of harassment should cease. And this speaks to the intimate connection between uh, the defense of different types of human rights. So these are very classical right to physical integrity, right to life uh, issues connected with issues of uh, life and livelihoods and also with um, environmental rights. So this is this case brings together those various generations and claims on uh, about uh, human rights uh, issues um, that are, of course, very interconnected. So um, with that, uh, we're going to bring this uh, session to a close. And with a, a reminder to community of practice members that uh, we will be moving to a separate link that you should have received in your emails. Uh, for everyone else, uh, if you're interested in joining the community of practice, please uh, do uh, send an email to the uh, address that was shared in the invitation to this uh, webinar. Uh, the community of practice session discusses more uh, action-oriented, uh, lessons uh, from the cases that we discussed. So uh, thanks everyone for your participation and for those of you who will be joining the community practice conversation, see you on the other end of the Zoom links. Bye bye everyone and thanks bye Mark everyone. and Rick again.